The Worship of the Skin Suit. This is actually a video that um, Brother and I pretty much came up with about, oh, two months ago. And the night previous to the making of this video, um, I was stirred. Whether or not that was the intent, I was stirred um, by some a very good, very good question. Um, also a very good point being made, but I was stirred um, to put this video out today. Um, I have been sitting on this until the Lord gave me the, it's like, okay, now's the time to do this. Um, been sitting on this until he gave the go ahead. And with last, with what transpired last evening, today is the day. Today is the day. And on to the dearly, dearly beloved sister that, um, who um, acted as the, see, one of the things that is good to have when you and the Lord are putting together something, a video, some of you like to refer to them as sermons, is someone to ask the questions of those who um, would be against it, for uh, being an advocate or something like that. Um, for example, uh, my best friend, our brother Alexander Hartley, who literally has before sat in front of me and played the advocate when we were going through things. It's like, well, okay, this would be the argument that someone would bring up to, to, to refute you. And it's like, oh, okay. And then we go through the scriptures. That's good. That's healthy. That is, that is a very good thing to have when coming up with something, when the Lord is guiding you to have someone to, uh, to kind of propose these things onto you. And because of that fact, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. I'm also going to tell you that this video, if you're a Catholic, this video is going to offend you. This video is going to offend you. Now, let me just say this for you uh, devil Jesuit Catholic coadjutors who play at being a uh, being of the Church of the Living God. But remember, you're Christians. Yeah, remember that. Let me give you your little thing here so you can go do your live streams and do your stupid little videos. Okay, here, let me give you something. The flesh profiteth nothing. All flesh is sinful. Here you go. The flesh of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, the flesh, the skin suit, was sinful. Oh, oh, blasphemy, right? Yeah, an unutterable blasphemy. Sh shut up, go away, there you go, make your live stream, do your little thing. I have a really good thumbnail for these videos. Uh, there's probably going to be two parts. I don't know at the recording of this if I'm going to put those thumbnails on there, on these videos, but we'll see. But that's for you coadjutors and you Catholics who worship the skin suit, the flesh, you know, your little round barrel, uh, bale cookie. That's for you guys. Go away. Now, like I said, this is going to offend you if you're a Catholic. And the point of us doing this is so those of you who worship flesh will realize that it's not flesh that saves you. See, Catholics are taught that there's, number one, no salvation outside the church, and they mean the building, and in order to receive Christ onto a Catholic, what do you got to do, Catholic? Come on. You have to eat his flesh and drink his blood, okay? And that's how you Catholics receive Jesus. And then when you, uh, someone tells you, according to the scriptures, that uh, all flesh is sinful, you take great offense at that because you're Catholic and you're all about flesh. Okay? Dear Catholic, your system is satanic. Your system is of Satan himself. 
and uh, we are going to go through this point by point. We're going to take our time. Got a very comfortable chair here to sit in. And it's very neat because this is the month of December, the Roman Catholic month of December with its, uh, uh, let me see if I get this right. Evil, pagan, satanic holiday, Christ mass, compound word, um, looming in the air, and the worship of the skin suit the little round sun-shaped bale cookie. All ties together. All ties together. So, with no more ado, got me a nice comfy chair here. <laughs> please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please follow me along. We got a lot of stuff we're going to go through. Going to take our time. We're going to go through point by point as we go. Okay? So, see... Part of Catholic salvation is ingesting the perfectly round, sun-shaped bale cookie, which, to a Catholic, the Eucharist is God. Because the Jesuit priest says the abracadabra, hocus pocus, over the cookie, or the cracker, and it magically, woody, 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 becomes Jesus Christ. The flesh, the blood, the guts, the hair, the eyeballs, everything. Spirit and whatever, toenails and whatever. And of course, the wine, woody, 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 <laughs> transubstantiation becomes the blood. It's, you, you really got to be of a special mindset to believe that kind of nonsense. <laughs> Catholics do. I was corrected before. You know, it's like, well, you eat Jesus and he's only with you about 15 minutes. I was corrected before. It's like oh, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> Thanks for the correction. Bye. <laughs> but, again, unto the Catholic. Flesh saves you. Is that not right? Why else, why, why else would you get so adamant and unutterable blasphemy? Calling this flesh the skin suit. And, okay, now, all, all flesh is sinful. Even the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the Word made flesh. Okay, we'll, we'll get into this. So, in saying that the flesh is sinful, does that mean that God is a sinner because the flesh was tempted? Does that mean that I'm calling God a liar? Very good. Very good. Again, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We are going to address this and many more. Okay. Now that's a little bit more than what you, you wicked heretics can handle. So run along now. This is not milk. Okay. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Genesis chapter 9. Okay. Genesis chapter 9. <laughs> You, you wicked Catholics, you poor, poor wicked Catholics who think so much about the flesh, proving that you are of the devil himself because the devil is a fan of man. He's all about the flesh, the skin suit. Okay? So, Genesis chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 under verse 5. Okay? Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 under verse 5. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you, and the dread of you, shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. We can go off in another direction on that one, but we won't. Verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood, 
of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Looking at verse 4 again. Do not look at me. Look at the scripture. Follow me along. Okay? But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So, flesh. What gives life to flesh? Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the puke rest. Oh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the flesh of Jesus. And see you wicked Catholic coadjutors. What do you do? Well, without any flesh, there isn't any blood. Bravo. Bravo. If I uh, give me your address, I'll ship you a bozo button. Bravo, bravo. But what say the scriptures? Okay, what say the scriptures? So verse four shows us what this is before the law. Verse four shows us what that you're not supposed to eat blood. Okay, now granted, you, you Catholics, you claim to drink blood, but um, okay, this is before the law. Genesis chapter 9. Now go to Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17, not Judges. Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17, we want verses 10 on to verse 14. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 on to verse 14. Under the law. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood. Against that soul. Because body and soul were connected because the circumcision made without hands wasn't there during this dispensation. Eternal security. The permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord is that spirit. The permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost was not there in this dispensation. So if you did something like you touched an unclean thing or you ate an unclean thing, that would affect your soul because the circumcision made without hands wasn't there. Okay? That's why it says, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. And among his people, salvation is of the Jews, remember. And uh, during the dispensation of the law, Jews, Israel was set apart. And you read that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, also in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and chapter 8. Uh, specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I believe it is, that Israel was set apart to be an example unto the nations of what, what nation so great has God so nigh them, Okay. Similar to us as the Church of the Living God, as ambassadors for Christ in this dispensation, which is comprised of both Jew and Gentile. See? Okay? Well, let's continue. Verse 11. For the life of the flesh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, again, the Catholics like, you can't have blood without flesh. Bravo! Bravo! But what, what is more important, flesh or the blood? And hey, 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 you easy believism Jesuit Catholic coadjutor devils, you make a big thing about the blood, don't you? It's the blood, not the skin suit, not the uh, skin suit, right? Come on, come on, it's the blood. We're going to see it, right? Come on, nod your little head, yes. Let's continue, okay? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the flesh that maketh an atonement for the soul. Oh, excuse me. For it is 
the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The blood. The blood. Not the flesh. I can't have blood without flesh. Bravo, bravo. Look at what we... It's the blood, not the flesh. See, you trying to circumvent the blood by exalting the flesh, can't have one without the other. Nice try, you wicked Catholic. Scripture says it's the blood. Okay? Um, and remember, God turned water into blood. So do you necessarily actually need flesh to have blood? When even the magicians in Egypt with their enchantments were able to turn water into blood themselves. <laughs> Verse 12. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel. See, it's, it's only for the Jews. It's only for the Jews. Shh, 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 shut up. I love you. Be quiet. No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger, someone who is not of Israel, that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof, and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no man of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. So what this tells us, dear friends, is that Blood is far more potent, far more important than flesh. Okay? And, yeah, yeah, you're right, the children of Israel were not supposed to eat blood. Okay? So, but now, Deuteronomy chapter 12, Deuteronomy chapter 12, Verse 23. Just one verse here. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Verse 23. Only be sure that thou eat not the blood. For the blood is the life. And thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. So right there, Catholic. But Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. That's just for the Jews. Oh, you're dispensational, huh? Well, yeah, dispensation comes from the Pope. It's interesting. When people don't rightly divide the word of truth, but then to defend their heresy, they will say, well, that's in a different thing, trying to apply dispensational truth. But then you say, oh, so you rightly divide the word of truth. How are you saved? By the blood of Jesus from, <laughs> from Genesis and Revelation. <laughs> People actually do that, you know. It's not funny, but they do. Yeah. Now, go to, now, before the law, don't eat blood. During the law, don't eat blood. Uh, that's for the Jews, right? Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. And what's significant about the book of Acts? Acts is a book of transition, just like the book of Exodus, uh, also like the book of Joshua, also like the book of Hebrews, so on and so forth, okay? The thing to remember about the book of Acts is that it is within this current dispensation. Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and shed his blood on the cross to make atonement for sin. Okay? Hence, bringing in this dispensation to time of the Gentiles. Okay? You have to remember that. But Acts chapter 15, so this is this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Okay? 
after the law. Acts 15, verses 24, on to verse 29. Acts chapter 15. This is during the Jerusalem Council. Or, well, how's that? Uh, Jerusalem camp meeting or whatever. <laughs> Acts chapter 15, verses 24, and verse 29. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Hmm, interesting. Have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things <laughs> that you abstain from meat offered unto idols. And from blood. Don't look at me. Look at the scripture right there. And from things strangled. And from fornication. From which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So, categorically, for the law, during the law, after the law, in this dispensation, um, eating, drinking, blood <laughs> is forbidden. Okay? Absolutely forbidden. And the blood is the life thereof of the flesh. Okay? Why is that? Because the flesh profiteth nothing. Okay? The blood is what gives flesh life. The blood is what cleanseth away our sins, okay? That's what our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, shed on the cross, okay? All right? You can make all your circular little wimpy arguments while well, without flesh. Deal with what we just looked at. But you can't. You won't, will you? Okay? Now, now go to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's look at some arguments. Like I said, dearly, dearly beloved, that was a really good, really good counter argument that you brought up. Praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You had something to, you had part to do with bringing this uh, to pass. As I told you, uh, the Lord used you yet again. So, praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. Just one verse. Now, we, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So we who are saved of the church of the living God. There are a ton of Christians out there. There are very few of the church of the living God. Okay? But we who are saved of the church of the living God, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. So see, the, the flesh, the, it's the flesh. The flesh is so important. The flesh is, that's, what are we, sinless? Hmm? What are we? We're sheep being led to the slaughter. We die daily. We are, what does that say? For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Second Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 on to verse 13. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. The seed of David. King of the, Jew, uh, <laughs> the, king of the Jews, okay? 
through Mary, whose lineage traces back onto David. Mary's lineage is listed in Luke, while um, Joseph's <laughs> lineage genealogy is listed in um, Matthew. Okay? The lineage of Mary is listed in Luke. Traces back to David. Okay? But as when it says as the seed of David, meaning king of the Jews, he's king. Okay? Jesus Christ, who is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. He came unto his own and his own received him not. We're going to look at that today, okay? But that's what that means, of the seed of David. Yes, yes, the skin suit that was produced from the body of Mary, okay? Which the word was made flesh, okay? Uh, that the flesh did have traits back on to David, yes. But as king, king of the Jews, he's going to sit upon David's throne as king, okay? Now let's continue. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes. Elect here means those who are saved Born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay? The elect, those who came to the Lord Jesus Christ on his terms, the way of the cross. Okay? That is the election there being spoken of. Remember, God chose. God elected the way of the cross. Hence, if you are saved... You are part of the elect because why the Lord chose the way of the cross, okay? Beware of Calvinism. Let's continue. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Dead with him. Dead to the world. If we suffer, we also we shall also reign with him. Suffer. Suffer for living our lives according to the standard of scripture. I guess lost my place. <laughs> if we deny him, he also will deny us. Now this does not mean salvifically. Okay? If you deny the Lord, if you're of the church of the living God, you deny the Lord in a situation, he'll deny you how? By maybe giving you a blessing, by uh, either uh, maybe protecting you for something, not providing for you or something like that. That has nothing to do with salvation, okay? The Lord orchestrates a, uh, orchestrates a circumstance where you know, where he says, you know, the Lord that lives within you, so say something. I, I, I put this together. Come on. Come on. And you, shh, you deny him? Or out of fear of man, which bringeth a snare? He might uh, let an enemy come and attack you. He might let something that he's been holding back or holding away from you come upon you. That's what that's talking about. It has nothing to do with salvation. Okay? Now let's continue. If we believe not... Yet, he, can, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So see, remember when the Lord appeared to then Saul? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Okay? We are his representatives. As it said, as, it, as we saw in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. We are of his bones and of his flesh. Okay? That does not mean, that does not mean that we are sinless. Okay? That does not mean that we are, uh, you know, sinless or anything like that. No, no. We are saved sinners. But he said to Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? See, we are ambassadors. We are sent out into this world to be ambassadors, having the ministry of reconciliation with the word of reconciliation, okay? 
So it, it begs you to wonder when you got these Catholics getting so rabid about the the bail cookie, the skin suit, um, how do they see themselves when they come to, well, we're part of his bones and of his flesh. Hmm. Are ye gods then? Meaning, because what do Catholics tell you? To imitate Christ? And beware of someone telling you to imitate Christ. Number one, you cannot be sinless. Number two, you can't raise people from the dead. You're not God. Hey, you're not God. You belong to him. You're his purchased possession. If you are saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus of the church of the living God, you are of his bones and of his flesh. Okay? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Okay, but see, the Catholic argument comes in and twists that. So if they say it's blasphemy, you call the flesh a skin suit. Hmm. Then you must think you're a God because, right, the Catholics tell you to imitate Christ, right? Yeah. Uh, 1 Corinthians now, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 16 on to verse 23. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 on to verse 23. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? You're the temple of God. So that must mean that you're a little Christ, huh? Little Christ. So when... You refer to the flesh as the skin suit, more rather the sin suit. We'll look at that here in a little later, of course. And you Catholics are told to imitate Christ, Christ who is God the Father, who never sinned, could not sin, raised people from the dead, did miracles. Hmm. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? What sanctifies the temple? The temple itself? Or, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, remember how we looked at it's the blood that gives life to the flesh? Okay? Is this temple anything without the Lord Jesus Christ? See, when you got God the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit dwelling within you, you are the temple of God, okay? If any man defile the temple of God, any man, meaning yourself or others, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are, ye are. Holy! Set apart. Your per he's, we are his purchased possession. The holy there is not talking about... <laughs> sinlessly perfect, okay? It's not talking about, you know, doing miracles like you could raise the dead, that you are God, you know? It's not that. Holy there, set apart. Holy is other than. Other than that, set apart, okay? So the temple of God is holy, set apart. You're his purchased possession, washed in the blood of Jesus, Okay? If any man, yourself or someone else, defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, set apart, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, like Catholics are, let him become a fool in the eyes of the world, that he may be wise. Why? For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Wise in their own craftiness. Coming up with very clever arguments. Clever disputes like you Catholics like to do. But when you analyze them through the scriptures, they just fall apart. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain, the wise, the wise of this world, wise in flesh, okay? 
Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours. <laughs> let no man glory in men. If, if Jesus Christ had a church, it would be the biggest one. An unutterable blasphemy. Calling this the flesh of Jesus Christ a skin suit. <gasps> Hmm. Therefore, let no man glory in men, which is exactly what you, you are doing, you wicked Catholic. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's. That doesn't, that doesn't mean you are little Christ's. Okay? That means, and, Christ's, and Christ is God's. What does that mean? You are his purchased possession. You belong to him if you are saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus of the church of the living God. If he saved you, you belong to him. Okay? All right. Did, you with me on that? I hope so. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 20, can't read my own writing. Verses 26 on to verse 31. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, all significations, dignities, of fleshly uh, adornments. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Oh, little old uneducated people who live in a two-bedroom apartment. Little uh, people who have, uh, you know, disabilities, but yet are in love with our Lord Jesus Christ and follow him according to his word. See, the world, if you have, according to the world, okay, if you are wise, okay, if you are mighty, if you are noble, according to man, according to the world, that, that makes you something. Remember, God is the God of the, of the little God. Of the little God. And Catholics, okay, Catholics, are wise after the flesh, are many, mighty. Christ had a church who would be the biggest one. Not many noble. Oh. Make people saints, like Ignatius of Loyola made him a saint. Mother Teresa, she made, him a, made her a saint. Yeah, made him a saint. Yeah. If you're saved, born again, converted to the church of the living God, you are a saint. Whether or not you live like one according to your own dictate and don't really follow the scriptures, uh, you are saved, born again, converted. God lives within you. You're a saint. Okay? Sainthood is not derived and given to you as a title of men like what Catholicism does to people. Beware of that. Let's continue. But God hath chosen, chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Little old nothing. Making someone so big drop everything that they're doing and pay attention to them. <laughs> like Jesuits who have threatened me. Me. Little old me. Nothing, nobody. But yet, got the attention of the Vatican itself. <laughs> hmm. And base things of the world, and things which are despised. Yeah, the world hates those who are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. But you know what the world doesn't have a problem with? Christians! Hmm. <clears throat> 
and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. <laughs> are you looking at verse 29? Come on, look at that. You looking at that? That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us, those who are saved, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. What is that a reference to? Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 20, come on. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 24 on to verse 25. Jeremiah 9, 24 on to verse 25. Jeremiah 9, 24 and 25. Oops. Excuse me. Verses 23 and 24. Oops, I wrote it down wrong. <laughs> Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. Beg your pardon. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Do you know God? Oh, oh, oh yeah, you know God because you, you can memorize some things. Do you know God as through a, a living relationship with someone who is truly alive? You know, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, okay? Are you, do you have a relationship with a living God? Or with a dead one? Which one do you have a relationship with? Do you know God because you have committed things to memory? Or do you have a relationship because you spend time with him in prayer, in his word? It's a dialogue, not a monologue, remember, okay? Remember, you guys, you wicked coadjutors who always throw that word around, dialogue. I want to dialogue with you. <laughs> anyway, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, we, we prophesied in your name. Look at what we've done in your name. We've done all these things. We, hey, we know you. Depart from me. Ye who work in iniquity. I never knew you. You know, you may think you know the Lord, but does he know you? Do you just rattle off some things in prayer and just go about your day? You do realize that when you are in prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ, you're talking to him personally, right? But do you read a prepared statement? Vain repetition? Now, go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Not Corinthians, Brad. Beg your pardon. Galatians chapter 6. We want verses 12 on to verse 16. Here's a little at you Catholics. As many, uh, uh, Galatians 6, verses 12 on to verse 16. As many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh, making proselytes, making them twofold, uh, twofold more the child of hell than themselves. I just brad eyes that, beg your pardon. But see, they want you to fall for them. They want you to follow them, okay? 
They want you to believe that the skin suit, the cookie, is God. That flesh is God. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Jesus Christ, Jesus, Jehovah saves. Christ, the anointed one. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Flesh is not God. <gasps> and see, you wicked Catholics. To you, flesh is God. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. But God forbid that I should God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world If we be dead with him we shall also reign with him dead unto that Okay Cross reference this. I, I didn't look in the margin here, but this cross reference this with 2 Timothy 2, verses 18 on to verse 13. Okay? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, Jew, or uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, Peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. I addressed this uh, in the uh, What is a Jew, or Who is a Jew videos, okay? Uh, the Israel of God. This has been addressed, I'm not going to address it here, okay? But what is Israel? One who, uh, a prince with God, who has favor with God and man? Okay? Now, Go to 1 Timothy. This is actually going a little bit quicker than I thought it would, which is good. Which is good. Taking our time. Not rushing anything. Okay? But 1 Timothy chapter 4. <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 on verse 3. Now the capital S spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of Catholics. <clears throat> Excuse me. And doctrines of Jesuits. <clears throat> Beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. And doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, not killed. I do not believe someone can kill their conscience. You can sear it, and when you sear something, like have you ever cooked a steak on the grill? Okay? You sear it on one side, you sear it on the other, and then you cook it, and then you put your fork and you take your knife, and then the blood, or it just all the juices, just bluey all over. Okay? Searing. Okay? You sear a piece of meat. Any of you who cook, you know what that means. Okay? You, you can't kill your conscience. You can sear it. Oh, boy, you're going to pay a big price when you stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and or at the great white throne of judgment. Which one is it going to be? Okay? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, Forbidding to marry, like Catholic priests do, but not only Catholic priests, other religions as well. And commanding to abstain from meats, not just Catholicism, Buddhists, 
that kind of stuff, do that kind of thing, you know, go for veganism. Unfortunately, I was a vegan myself for a little while too, okay? Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Why don't we look at this? Matthew chapter 15. See, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. See, you want to believe that there's something good in you. So when you got a Catholic coming around, getting all up in arms, saying that you said that the flesh of Jesus Christ is sinful. Oh, so God could sin? Huh? You're calling God a liar? That's what some of the arguments that they will bring up. And I'm thankful that the, uh, you brought that to my attention about that. Thank you for that. But, you know, they, could bring, they bring that up. And see, what they are doing is they're putting themselves into that picture. Because as a Catholic, imitate Christ. They are little Christs. Hey, their Jesuit priest is another Christ. See? I mean, their conscience seared. And they want to believe that in some, that they are good. And that's what Catholicism is about. Work salvation without the assurance of salvation. Hey, you Catholic. What if you died today? Well, I, I, I ate Jesus today. <laughs> I, I, I got prayed up. I went to Mass. Uh, I've said all the rosaries and stuff. I did this, 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 this today. Today. What about tomorrow? You're not promised tomorrow. Well, you got to die in a state of grace, right? See, adorning the flesh. They put their, themselves into that. That's why they get so offended. This profits nothing. This profits nothing. It's a sagging skin suit. Okay? Skin suit. Okay? Now go to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 on to verse 9. Hmm. Hmm. This can be applied to more than just the Eucharist cookie with, in light of certain things. About the commandments of men. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the traditions? The tradition of the elders. Tradition. Tradition. Oh, some traditions are good. But yes, the traditions that Paul talked about are described within the context. Nice try. Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? How are we transgressing the commandment of God? Oh, a little idolatry there? You know, making, adoring. Go adore Jesus in the monstrance, which is, a yeah, monstrance is that big sun thing with the cookie in the middle of it. Okay, that's a monstrance, okay? Go adore Jesus. You, do you realize when a Catholic says to adore Jesus, you could take a little Ritz cracker and it's like, woody, 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 here, here's your Jesus. Why do ye also transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? That, that goes a little bit more than just the Pucharist about certain things that have to do with this month. See, I'm not living in the past though. I'm not the one that brought that up. That was done over a year ago almost. Almost a year ago. And I'm just bringing this up. Who really is trying to start strife and debate? Anyway, anyway, thank your part. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. <laughs> but ye say, 
Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. By your tradition. And Catholics, tradition is up here. The script, okay. Tradition is way up here. Scriptures are way down here. And if Sosa says something, even when everything Sosa says is against the scriptures, they they will go with their Pope, Sosa. Hey, remember, Francis <coughs> Francis is a Jesuit. And according to Jesuit doctrine and teaching, every Jesuit is subservient unto the superior general of the order. Sosa. Sosa. Okay? Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. Oh, you love Jesus, you're defending Jesus. Oh, you said that the flesh is sinful, blasphemy. But their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And go back now to 1 Timothy chapter 4, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 4 again. Commandments of men. Uh, just verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Doctrines of devils. The commandments of men. The commandments of Catholics is the doctrines of devils. And what is at the root here? And their counter-arguments that they come up to defend their little way for God. Hmm? What is that? Oh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, one verse. I think you know what verse we're going to read. I hope you do. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. <laughs> and this is what goes a lot deeper than just the adoration of a cookie. It's the month of December, isn't it? Uh, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And every time, every time that I've encountered this ridiculous, nonsensical, stupid thing about the skin suit argument, was, which was brought up by some crazy Catholic uh, from Blackpool, England, okay, proving that he was, he's a Catholic, okay? Um, it always goes back to them being very philosophical about it. Not dealing with scripture. Why is that? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Why is that? See, you want to feel like you're doing something good, that you are good. You are a little Christ, right? You're imitating Christ. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 on to verse 17. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught. We just read about... Keep reading. Whether by word or our epistle. So the traditions... 
by word or our epistle. So the traditions that Paul is referring to are based off of what? Scripture. Scripture. And you look at the traditions of men, the traditions of the Pentecatholics, the traditions of the Catholics, the traditions of the Bathlicks, the Methodics, <laughs> Methylics, beg your pardon, I'm sorry, tongue tied, Methylics, the Catholic Lutherans, all the traditions of men, their traditions, are they based off of scripture? Doubtful. Most doubtful. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us ever us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, and establish you in every good word and work. And while we're here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 on to verse 15. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. There you again you see the tradition. And when you compare this with, uh, where is that? Uh, verse 15 in chapter 2. And hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. And the, our epistle, meaning with the scripture. So a brother who is walking disorderly. Hmm. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Okay? According to the scriptures. But he also goes on to define a little bit more about this specific passage. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. There you see again disorderly twice. How do you live an orderly life? How does a young man cleanse his way? But by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Whether by our word or epistle? See, the true traditions that Paul was referring to are right here. Okay, not, not in the catechism, in uh, the thing of the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, nothing like that. The Baptist Confession of, what is it, 1649, not in the... Um, the uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion by uh, Calvin, okay, or the Book of Discipline by the Methodists, or, or Luther's Small and Large Catechism. No, those are traditions of men, okay? The traditions that Paul is referring to are right here. Not in all those other outside sources, Okay? Let's continue. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with you, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power. We've addressed this before in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul had power to forbear working. But he did it, number one, because he was all by himself. He was a single man. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have children. Okay? But not because we have not not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Don't put you, you know, you're so high up, higher than anybody else. Okay? So much higher. You wouldn't kind of send the men of low estates, see. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. Paul, the greatest of the church of the living God, out there in the fields, digging dirt with fellow man, elbow to elbow, amongst the poor and needy. Could you do something like that? For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 
But he said in verse 9, not because we have not power. See, there is work that is work with the hands and stuff like that. And there is also the work of the Lord. You can do the work of the Lord through the work with the hands, but there are some out there whom the Lord will call to specifically concentrate on doing the work of the Lord. You know, working with your hands. Okay? A lot of people have a lot of problem with that. Why? Because of these devils who take advantage of that. Who rub it into people's faces. You know? You, you know, if the Lord has blessed you, praise him for his blessings, yes. But, you know, you shouldn't bear everything that the Lord has given you out in public. Okay? There are certain things that you ought to keep to yourselves. <laughs> okay? Why? Because look what happens when you start talking about all this financial stuff and all these things that the Lord has blessed you for. You know, yes, we of the Church of the Living God who are called to these positions, we are to be transparent, but that doesn't mean that we divulge everything. Why? Because look what happens. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Busybodies. We're looking at this because of the tradition thing, okay? The tradition thing, because what do the Catholics say? Well, Paul talks about traditions. We're talking about the traditions that he's talking about, okay? For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not according to the scriptures, working not at all, but are busy bodies. There, there are those out there who can make an art form of making it look like they're doing something while they ain't doing nothing. That weird Taoism stuff is all about that, pretty much, pretty much. I'm going to be doing a video debunking that stuff here in sometime in the future, Lord willing, just so you know. But I used to work for a guy uh, with a guy who is Jewish, who is pretty much one of the most laziest men I've ever met. Sweetheart of a guy, but really, really lazy. The guy knew how to make it look like he was busy doing something when in fact he was just twiddling his thumbs. Now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man, get a load of this, obey not our word by this epistle. Okay, epistle, our word. Verse 15 in chapter 2, by word or our epistle. Again, the tradition that is being spake of in this context has all to do with the epistles, scripture. Okay? Not, and who wrote the scriptures? Man did! No, God did. God used man's hand. Yes, he did. But it was God is the author. God breathed. Okay, God wrote the scriptures through the hand of man, dear friend. Okay, But you see that. Our word or epistle. Not the Pope's word and the catechism. Not the pastor's word and the institutes of the Christian religion. Okay? Not the pastor's word and the, uh, uh, what is that thing called? Tao Te Ching, or whatever it is. <laughs> okay? And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. I know we read a little bit more. By all means, the Lord be with you all. Okay? So those are the traditions. The, tra the traditions of men contradict, uh, you know, go against the scripture. Even though they might say that they're loosely based upon scripture. 
but they go too far. They exaggerate themselves. And in that exaggeration and going too far, they contradict. When the traditions that Paul was talking about, either by word or epistle, have all to do with what, buddy? The scriptures. Everything to do with the scriptures. Now, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 13 on verse 21. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 1. 13 on the 21. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, set apart, other than holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We can't be sinlessly perfect. We can't imitate Christ because, number one, Christ is God the Father, okay? Number two, Christ never sinned. He could not sin, okay? And number three, he could raise the dead. He could, you know, make water into wine. Yes, I know the Egyptians of uh, in Egypt did that, but see, he could do things that we can't, okay? You got to remember that, okay? Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be other, separate. Come out from amongst them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you, Okay? And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers. Are you looking at verse 19? But by the precious flesh of Christ. But by the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Remember the thing about the lamb. Okay. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Not flesh. Not flesh. Now, First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 under verse 25. Okay? First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 under verse 25. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Now, look at verse 22. Who did no sin. Are you looking at that? Who did no sin. God cannot sin. God cannot be tempted with evil. We'll, we'll get into that. We will get into that. But you got to remember, who did no sin? If Christ sinned, he would not be a lamb without spot. If temptation were sin, he would not be a lamb without spot. You got to remember, dear friend, beloved, temptation. It's not a sin. Sin, what is sin? What is sin? What is sin? Someone asks you, what is sin? What is sin? Again, beware of philosophy and vain deceit. Um, what is sin? First John, first John chapter three. First John chapter three, verses four under verse five. What 
is sin. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Now, one can sin in thought. Yes, our Lord said, you can, if you look on a maid and lust after her in your heart, okay, you've sinned already. But see, Jesus, who is God the Father, cannot be tempted to do evil. Hence, God never sinned. See, we are not like God. We have God living within us, but see, God could not be tempted to do evil. God cannot sin. God never sinned. The flesh, you know, the skin suit, the flesh of God, that's where the temptation lay. It was the flesh. But God, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God is manifest in the flesh. Okay? Okay? Our spirit and soul are within the skin suit. Okay? My soul looketh out at you from this veil. Skin suit, the flesh. Okay? You, you, you with me? Good. Okay. So, what are we looking at? Okay. What is sin again? Whosoever commits sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. And Christ Jesus, God the Father, God manifest in the flesh, fulfilled the law. And if temptation was sin, he could not have fulfilled the law. Temptation is not sin. What do you do with that temptation? Aha! And see, God cannot be tempted to do evil. See, and see, these Catholics, I'm, I love, I love that that was brought up to me last night. I, praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because, well, you're saying that the, the flesh of Jesus was sinful. So, Jesus could have sinned. Back in here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Uh... Uh, verse 22, who did no sin. God can't sin. Jesus never sinned. God, it's impossible. God cannot sin. Okay? Neither was guile found in his mouth. See, what Catholics don't do, they don't separate the flesh from God. Remember, it's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God is manifest, or was manifest, in the flesh. Catholics make God flesh. When God himself said a flesh, it's, it's a veil. It, it, it profiteth nothing. It's the word that was made flesh, dear friend. Just that you have to separate the flesh from God, even though God was manifest in the flesh. Okay, See, that's what Catholics don't do. That's what Catholics don't do. And it said... Who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled. Reviled not again. When he suffered. He threatened not. But committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self. Bear our sins in his own body. On the tree. So that proves that the flesh is. Shut up. Shut up. Where has sin been relegated to. Well, we'll look at that. Remember this, because we're going to touch on it here in a little bit, okay? Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. And it, that's Isaiah chapter 53. Read Isaiah chapter 53 on your own time, okay? 
For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10. What is that? What is that? Verses 1 on to verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the, of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon to perfect. Because the blood of bulls and goats could only, you know, cover, while the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth, washeth away, okay? That's why they had to do it continually, okay? So it can only cover their sin. The blood of God, the blood, the blood of God washed it all away, okay? For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin he would not. Neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ once for all. Oh, see, see, Brandon, it's the body, it's the body, it's the flesh, it's the flesh. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 on to verse 21. Okay? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. What can wash away your sins? Oh, it's by the body. Well, the blood came from the body. Yes, you're right. But what washed away your sins? Was it the flesh? No, it was the blood. Uh, again, remember, they're genius. Um, Moses turned water into blood. The magicians of Egypt turned water into blood. Okay? By a new and living way, which he which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. The veil. What is a veil? You know, the veil in the temple was rent in twain. The veil covered the holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. The veil. You see a person put on a veil. It's a covering. So the blood is the life of the flesh thereof. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? The flesh is the covering, a veil, okay? The life-giving blood came out from the veil. Uh, flesh is considered a veil, and the veil was rent in twain. See, that's the significance of the, uh, the veil in the temple being rent in twain. Yes, it signifies that that has been taken away that it's open now to both Jew and Gentile in this dispensation. But see, the flesh is as a veil because, because, okay, why? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, because he took away the old, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest, over the house of God. How, how far are we reading here? 
Let us draw near with, true, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I remember out of a side came water and blood. Okay? That doesn't mean that you need to be baptized, Catholic. Okay? Okay? Signifying flesh, that the flesh is the veil from whence our redemption came. Okay? Gave him a body. It's not that the flesh is the thing that sanctifies. It's not that the flesh is the thing that saves. The flesh was the veil. Why? Because the flesh profiteth nothing. Nothing. The flesh can be tempted. God, Jesus Christ, is come in the flesh. God, within flesh, could not be tempted. But the flesh could. The flesh could. And that's not indirectly calling God a liar or saying God sinned. No, because we, 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 we looked at it. In him is no sin. God cannot sin. But God in this, the flesh, the flesh can be tempted. And remember, temptation is not sin, dear friend. Temptation is not sin. Don't forget that. Temptation is not sin. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. The veil. Remember that. The veil. That is his flesh. Okay? The blood is the life thereof. A veil is a covering. Okay? Again, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? The flesh profiteth nothing. Okay? Our, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What sanctifies the temple? The actual flesh itself or God that was, is within it? Exodus chapter 12. We gotta, we gotta go through this. We gotta go through this. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and, uh, and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year, year to you. Now this is the uh, Old Testament. This is the Passover, which is a type of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and note what is significant here again. Okay, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. And if temptation were sin, then Jesus Christ would have had a blemish. And yet the scriptures say he had no sin. Remember, temptation is not sin, beloved. Okay. A male of the first year, Jesus was the firstborn of Mary, not her only son, you wicked Catholics, okay? Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Came from the sheep. He came uh, out from Israel, okay? And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Well, that means they were looking forward to the cross all the way. But no, you read Ephesians chapter 3. It wasn't revealed until Paul. Okay. It wasn't revealed. They were not looking forward to the cross back here in Exodus. Uh, yes, it's 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 a type. It's, you know, up here on the side post. Yes. Top that. Yes, we know that. But they were not looking forward to the cross. Okay? They weren't. If they were, they would have been more, you know, go on, Lord, we're waiting for you to do this. No. No, they weren't. They were not looking forward to the cross. Okay? This is symbolizing 
what was to come. Because remember, from the beginning, he chose the way of the cross, but it wasn't revealed until Paul. Don't forget that, okay? And they, uh, we already read, uh, okay. And they shall take of the two of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt, instruction and righteousness, Egypt, type of the world, this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment, judgment, I am the Lord. And the blood, the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The blood, the blood, dear friend, it's, it's the blood. It's the blood. Uh, Genesis chapter 22. Remember the veil I uh, we talked about, okay? The lamb, the veil, okay? Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, a lamb. A lamb without spot, without blemish. The veil, that is his flesh. Okay? The veil, the vessel used to draw the blood of God out to make an atonement for sin. It's the blood. It's not the flesh. The flesh profiteth nothing, dear friend. Even if you want it to, even if you want to make it salvific, the flesh of Jesus Christ, the flesh Profiteth nothing. It's the blood. Okay, yeah, again. Uh, without the flesh, you could have no blood. Bravo. Deal with the scriptures. If the flesh was a necessity for you to ingest for your salvation, he would have said so. It's the blood. Okay? Now, go to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Verses 22 on to verse 24. Catholic. Symbolic. Uh, this is symbolic. This is not salvific. Very similar to the Passover dinner. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it and gave to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. He did not do transubstantiation. It's symbolic just like the unleavened bread of Passover, okay? And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. The blood. The blood that he shed for many. The blood. The shedding of the blood, okay? This is symbolic. This is not literal, Catholic. This is not literal. Now, with that, go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 61 on to verse 65. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? That the flesh is nothing? That the flesh of Jesus Christ, the flesh was sinful? God manifest in the flesh? God cannot sin? 
in him was no sin. Okay? But the flesh was sinful. Does that offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. These are red words. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The flesh profiteth nothing. But there are some of you that believe not. No, you believe in yourselves. That you're a good person. Why? Because you ain't your Jesus. Or you said the rosary or whatever. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And, and, and Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Just one verse. Verse 41. Again, Catholic. Watch and pray. Matthew 26 verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. But the flesh is weak. Weak. Why? Because it profiteth nothing. Words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Okay? And Ephesians now, a couple of one verses here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Just one verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, not his flesh. You can make your petty, childish, stupid argument, oh, there's no blood without flesh. If flesh was a necessity for salvation, it would say so. All of that says is the blood. And when you have God himself saying, the flesh profiteth nothing, that was just the vehicle. What runs the vehicle? That was just the veil. What's behind the veil? What sanctifies the temple? Oh and, oh, and Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Come on. Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 on to verse 24. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh <gasps> through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, again, you might be saying in, uh, where was that? In verse 23? I don't know where it was that. In verse 22? In the body of his flesh through death okay we've already looked at that we've already said that our Lord himself said 
The flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh was the vehicle, okay? The flesh itself profiteth nothing. It was the blood that came from that that was shed on the cross. Yes, yes, you're right. But see, it's the blood that makes the atonement for you, okay? It's not the flesh. It's not the flesh, okay? You have hope on our Lord Jesus Christ that what he did on the cross paid for your sin, okay? Uh, go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Hopefully we can finish this one within the time period, huh? 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the capital W word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You say you're not a sinner, you don't need to be saved. The truth is not in you. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, born again, converted to the church of the living God? If we say we have not sinned, I don't sin anymore. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay? John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 on to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, one, uh, the beginning of one of seven times that the capital W Word appears, okay? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Why? Why? The Word made flesh. The first three uh, verses in Genesis chapter 1 show you the Godhead. You know, God, in the beginning God, Spirit moved upon the waters, okay? God the Father, the Spirit. God said, spake the Word, Spirit, soul, and body. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, okay? That's the Godhead. In the very first uh, three verses in Genesis, Okay. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that capital L light but was sent to bear witness of that capital L light. That was the true capital L light, which lighteneth, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, verses 7 on to verse 9, you see capital L four times. Our Lord Jesus Christ, referring to our Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. The Word made flesh, spoke into existence. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, 
the Jews, the Hebrews, and his own received him not. Isaiah chapter 53, people, okay? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man, but of God. The will of man, the will of the flesh. You are, you're saved because you say you are, because you just believe? Or did you come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, called upon the name of the Lord? Those are his conditions. Look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. Come on, fingers work with me, not against me. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, verses 6 on to verse 12. This is he that came by water and blood. Water and blood signifying a natural birth. Okay? Even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bear, beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Water and blood. You've heard of women who are with child, when they are birthing, their water breaks, and there's a lot of blood, denoting a natural birth. The Spirit was upon Mary, and by the Spirit, she was with child, okay? Okay? For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father... The Word, which was made flesh, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Soul, God the Father. The body, the Word, made flesh. Okay? For there are three that bear a record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Not three persons that make one God. <laughs> No, one, spirit, soul, and body, okay? And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Notice it says witness in the earth because Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, okay? Earth, natural birth, okay? The spirit, which was over Mary, and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Okay? Talking about a natural birth there. How Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Okay? Not that the flesh itself was God, you wicked Catholic. Okay? If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Talking about the Holy Ghost. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record, the scriptures, that God gave of his Son. And you Catholics don't believe the scriptures. You, your Jesuit leaders... As Leone talked about, uh, yeah, they believe the scriptures because the scriptures condemn your system. Okay? And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things, verse 13, have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know 
that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And see, you Catholics, sin of presumption. You can't presume that you're saved when the scriptures say we are to know. Beg your pardon. We are to know. We can know that we are saved. We're going to go to heaven with our Lord when we die. Okay? Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Here, here it is in a nutshell. Okay? This is what Satan does. This is what Satan is all about. Okay? We saw... Our Lord said himself, the flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh is weak. Flesh does not save you. Okay? But what does Satan do? What is Satan all about? Matthew chapter 16, verses 20 on to verse 23. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, Jehovah saves, the Christ, the anointed one. From that time forth, Jesus began to shew unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And because they were looking forward to the cross all the way in Genesis, then Peter said, took him and began to uh, rebuke him saying, Go, Lord, go, go, we're... You Catholics. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Flesh. Flesh. Look at, the, look, at, look at the world. Look at the advertisements. Look at the TV. Look at the culture. Look at the fashions. Look at, look at it. It's all about man. It's all about flesh. Okay? Okay? And remember in Genesis chapter 3. Okay? Ye shall be as gods. Knowing good and evil, he said unto Eve, Thou shalt not surely die, for God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And then in Isaiah chapter 14, of course, Isaiah chapter 14, let's go there really quickly. Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to verse 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Son of the morning, not morning star. You got the Bibles that put morning star in there. Morning star is a title for Jesus Christ. Th those Bibles are blasphemy. Because they tell you that Jesus was cast out of heaven. Fallen from heaven. That's blasphemy. No, Lucifer, son of the morning. Son created being of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. There, there it is. You shall be as God, you Catholics. Your little gods, remember? Uh, imitate Christ, right? You eat your little cookie. You have Christ within you. You're imitating Christ. You, you Catholics and your perverse, warped thing with the flesh is, is pretty disgusting. Okay? And let's read verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Okay? Now, go to Hebrews. Go to Hebrews, chapter 2. The flesh of Jesus Christ was sinful, but Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God could not be tempted to do evil. Okay, beg your pardon, brethren. Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 on to verse 18. Okay? Uh, remember, beloved, I told you about this, the context? Okay? 
For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil. He also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. God was in flesh. God was a man. Okay? And God felt, went through every single temptation that you and I will go through. Okay? And delivered them who, and delivered, and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Seed of Abraham, the line of the Hebrew. Okay? Abraham was of Shem, but not everybody of Shem is of as a Hebrew. The line of the Hebrews is specifically of Abraham. And it is that line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob where Jews are derived of, because unto the Hebrew, the Jews were given the law. Okay? Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, pacify, help them that are tempted. But wait, 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 wait. Time out. God cannot be tempted with evil, right? That's what James says, right? But yet it says here he was tempted. Is temptation a sin? No. What do you do with that? For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. God the Father in flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. You know he could read minds. He knew what people were thinking. We're, we're not God. Don't you think that vexed God being around his creation, knowing what they were thinking? You think that didn't vex him? God in the flesh being around these women? Okay? His flesh... The temptation was in the flesh, not him himself, because Jesus didn't have a desire for women. Why? Because if he did, if he did, he would be a lamb without blemish. He would be a he wouldn't be a lamb without blemish. See, it was the flesh that was tempted, not God. Okay, you have to make that separation. You know, because today we are saved. God lives within us. That circumcision made without hands. Get it? So, if temptation were a sin, then Jesus Christ sinned. But see, God can't be tempted to do evil. Can he? Getting a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, before we get into uh, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, go to James chapter 1. Okay, we're, we're going to do a little expository in this. But James chapter 1, okay? Let no, uh, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay? But yet he was tempted. What was tempted? The flesh. The flesh. But see, God within flesh... God could not be tempted by that flesh. But see, because God was in flesh, he felt that temptation. Because the flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh is wicked. The flesh is sinful. Flesh has been relegated to, uh, sin has been relegated to the flesh. Okay? The flesh could be tempted. Every single one of Satan's temptations, every single one was aimed right here. And what did Jesus say? It is written. It is written. It is written. He answered him with scripture. Okay? Jesus himself, God manifest in the flesh, was not tempted. No. We just saw God cannot be tempted with evil. But 
God manifest in the flesh. The skin suit. And that's what you worship! No, no, no. No, no. See, that's not calling God a liar. That's not saying that indirectly Christ sinned. No, because he cannot be tempted with evil. To look upon a, a maid with lust. Okay? No. No. If he did that, he would have sinned, wouldn't he? Because he said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you look upon a maid and lust after her in her heart, if Jesus would have done that, he would have sinned, wouldn't he? But how many times have we thus far looked at that in him was no sin? See, beloved, the temptation is not a sin. The temptation was to the flesh. God within the flesh was not tempted because God can't sin. See, that's not calling God a liar. That's not indirectly saying God sinned. But no, no. <laughs> if you still hold to that, that it's saying that I'm telling you that Jesus sinned or indirectly, there's a problem there. There's a problem there. We have seen already abundantly in him it was no sin. All temptation was at the flesh for our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the flesh is sinful. That's why the flesh profiteth nothing. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 on to verse 16. For we... <laughs> For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. See, around the women, the flesh, very well, yes, the flesh. See, he struggled with that because the flesh, the flesh, Yearn for sin. See, the struggle that was there was God was in flesh feeling our infirmities. Okay, that's what that means. Okay, look at that verse. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. God knew what it was like because he was in flesh to hunger. He knew because of the flesh what it was, what it meant to. He felt what we felt in temptation, but he himself was tempted, was not tempted. Why? Because God cannot be tempted with evil, but he experienced it through the flesh. Being around all those women that ministered unto him through the flesh. And knowing what men thought, and knowing what the flesh. And what some of these women, who knows, what, what some of these women that were around him found him attractive, maybe? We don't know. Okay? But see, again, it was the flesh. It was the flesh. Jesus never sinned. And if you are saying that I am saying Jesus indirectly sinned, uh, uh, there's a problem there. And if you're going to continue to say that, we have a problem. Because what saith the scripture? But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. See, beloved, it's the flesh. It's what we're, and this is what the Catholics talk about. Okay? Indirectly, Jesus never sinned. No. Jesus could not sin. We, we already looked at that in James chapter 1. Okay? God doesn't, you know, God tempted no man. The Abraham thing, if I can remember, I'll put the link in again for that in this uh, video, okay? God cannot be tempted with evil. God was manifest in the flesh, okay? It's the flesh. You, you get me? Okay? Now, let's continue. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He was tempted in all points like we are, but without sin. 
And God cannot be tempted with evil. But God manifests in the flesh. I, I'm beating a dead horse. Okay? You you <laughs> Okay. Now let's really let's really drive this home. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 under verse 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son what else can I say to you people God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh <laughs> and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, after the Spirit. See, with this truth, if you still want to hold to your Pucharist, or hold to that, well, Brad's saying that Jesus sinned, because... That, that's a problem. The flesh of Jesus Christ, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, people. You know, you want to deny this truth and still hold to your little pucarist. Any one of you who hold to that? So, oh, the, the skin suit, the skin suit. <laughs> You're Catholic, and you worship a cookie. Your God is flesh. Your God is the devil. End of story. End of story. It. Done. Fine. Kaput. That's it. Your God is Satan. If you want to instill, if you make it this far, your God is Satan. You want to defend the flesh. Oh, that's flesh for me. You're coming. likeness of sinful flesh and as uh, as we have been quoting uh first timothy chapter three first timothy chapter three this is one of the most ridiculous things that i've ever come across that and next to the christ last thing but this this is just absolutely ridiculous and people who come up with this argument shoo that they are catholic some will ask uh, legitimately because they don't know praise and be as the uh, advocate to bring out more truth praise the Lord for that praise the Lord praise the Lord okay but people who want to hold to this oh that's blasphemy you're a Catholic you're a Catholic and I hope you don't choke on your little way for God cooking it's what I think of your cooking it's what I think of your God, which is Satan. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Justified in the spirit. Here's the Savior of Israel. You know, the spirit came down upon him, you know, showing people, hey, here I am. Here's God manifest in the flesh. Here I am. I'm your Messiah. Here I am. That's what that was for. If I can remember, I'll put that in the in the description box as well. Okay? Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay? And something that was brought up that was really, really beautiful about in Daniel chapter 11, this, and this was a great point. This was a really good point. Brava, sister. Brava. Wonderful. 
this was a really good point. Daniel chapter 11, verse 37. Okay? Daniel chapter 11, verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. Now, when some people come to this, the two pervasive arguments are what? That he's either going to be a queer, or he's going to be a celibate Catholic. But what was brought up to me is, if the son of perdition is trying to imitate God, he will be like Christ, not having a desire for God, a desire for women. Which is a really good point, sister. Bravo. Really good point. Really good point. But then again, you got to remember, there are people, men out there, who do not desire women, but yet will use and abuse them nonetheless. None the same. you got to keep that in mind. But that, that was a really good point. You know, that was a really good point. Because that, that man of sin, the son of perdition, he's going to be what? A copycat, a counterfeit, trying to imitate God, right? He shall be like the Most High. And Christ had no desire physically for women. He had no desire for them at all. But yet the flesh was tempted. That was a really, really good point, by the way, sister. That was a, uh, my dearly, dearly beloved sister. That was a really, really good point. That was a really, really good point. Um... Uh, at once, uh, I've teeter-tottered. It's like, hey, he could be a sodomite. He could be a celibate Catholic. I am more leaning toward upon searching the scriptures. You know, I, I believe. You know, could he have been? A, could he be a queer? Maybe. I personally believe it's more of a celibate Catholic that I'm celibate and that kind of stuff. But when you put into the equation that he is going to be counterfeiting Christ. He has not the desire of women. Very good point. Very good point. Had to touch on that. Had to touch on that. That was mwah. that was beautiful. Very good point. Something for you all to consider there. Something for all for you to consider there. And let's before we get to James chapter one. James chapter one. Before we get to that, go to first, uh, Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. Probably going to be able to get this in one video, which is good. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. A lamb without spot, without blemish. God will provide himself a lamb. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Who knew no sin. The flesh was tempted. And the struggle that he struggled with was, ew. You know, the vexation that God must have felt while in flesh. A perfect, sinless God who cannot sin. See, we, our finite minds can't grasp that. Why? Because we're sinners. We sin every day. We can't be sinlessly perfect. But one who is perfect who is without sin, who fulfilled the law, okay? If he had sinned, he couldn't have fulfilled the law, okay? Never taught that, never said that. But see, his struggle was the vexation. That's the struggle that he struggled with. A perfect, sinless creator, a perfect, sinless God, in sinful flesh, We can only tentatively imagine what kind of vexation that must have been to a holy, harmless, sinless, perfect God who was in the veil, who was in sinful flesh. That's what the struggle was, beloved. Okay? That's what the struggle was. The flesh was tempted. The flesh probably was tempted by the women. But God within that flesh could not be tempted to do evil. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. You know, I've addressed this in several videos. 
But this one is going to, this one, this one, James chapter 1, verses 9 on to verse 15. James chapter 1, verses 9 on to verse 15. Not John, Brad, beg your pardon. James chapter 1, verses 9 on to verse 15. Let the brother of low degree result in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. And of course, you look in, uh, what is it, Isaiah chapter 40, all flesh is as grass. See, you Catholics holding to your defense of the skin suit gets blown away. All flesh is as grass. Even the flesh of Jesus Christ, which we have already seen in the likeness of sinful flesh. And he was tempted like we are, but yet didn't sin. And temptation is not sin. Remember, sin is a transgression of the law. And Christ fulfilled the law. Sin is an action. You can look and lust. That's a sin. Christ could look. He didn't sin because he had no lust. Christ never sinned. Okay? For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. For all, my dear friend from Blackpool, your argument, your pathetic Catholic argument, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, has been destroyed. Roll that up in your cigarette and smoke it. For all flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word, the words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Isaiah chapter 40. Come on. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I know you want me to say your name, but I'm not going to. I don't play like that. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 and 8. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is, uh, is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, James chapter 1, picking up at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Endureth temptation. Temptation is not sin. Remember that. And thank you. I know you looked. To try to find something that showed that temptation was sin. Bless your heart and soul. Temptation is not a sin. I know you looked for that. I know you did. I know you did. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Temptation is not sin. What you do in that temptation? Aha. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And I have written down here Luke chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 13. Um, we'll go there. Come on. Luke chapter 4. Why not? Why not? Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. 
Luke chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 13 again. He was in all like in all points tempted like as we, yet never sinned. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. Going after the flesh, the belly, hunger. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, shewed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Covetousness. Look at, if Christ had a church, it would be the biggest one. Okay, can you see the tie-in? Look at all this. See, huh? covetousness, pride, flesh. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. Look at how beautiful it looks. Tempting the flesh. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it, because he values the things that be of men and not of God. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Talking to the flesh. Talking to the flesh. Because God, we just looked at it. God cannot be tempted with evil. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Again, tempting the flesh. Go ahead, kill yourself. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and to and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. A stone. Again, hey, tempting the flesh. You 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 say you're God, right? Go ahead and kill yourself, because if you're God, the, you'll bring yourself back to life. See another temptation to the flesh. And Jesus answered, answering, said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Can you picture our Lord Jesus like, Oy vey. <laughs> it is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And now go back to James, and kind of close the scriptures, okay? James chapter 1. I closed the scriptures, sorry. Sorry, breaking the... They flow there. James chapter 1, verse 14. But every man is, but every man is tempted, comma, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's what Jesus Christ did not have. So we, we just saw that in Luke chapter 4. So see, the women could be around Jesus Christ. His flesh, the flesh could have been, you know, going for that or whatever. Yes, but God himself within that flesh. See, God could not be tempted to do evil. Okay, that we just looked at that in verse 13. When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Christ could not be drawn away of his own lust because he had no lust. He could not be enticed. Okay? Verse 13. Okay? But see, in all points he was tempted like as we are, but yet he sinned not. Okay? Again, it's all about the flesh. Okay? The flesh is sinful. The flesh is wicked. The flesh is weak. It profiteth nothing. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Sinful flesh. We looked at it in Romans. You can't avoid this anymore. You can't. Okay? And Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. 
Romans chapter 6, verses 19 on to verse 23. I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness, being separate. Servants, not slaves. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through, Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And James chapter 1, verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, and see, Christ had no lust. He didn't, because he's God. He, he can't be tempted to do evil like that. Okay? But again, I'm beating a dead horse. The flesh was tempted. That is not anything indirectly saying that Christ is, could have sinned or sinned. That's not nothing indirectly at all. No. 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 <laughs> okay? Not calling God a liar either. I love you very much. If you hold to that, we have a problem. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And hence, Christ went to the cross willingly to make an atonement for us. And see, there's a teaching that Jesus married Mary Magdalene. What was that? That was the Da Vinci thing, right? He would have been a, he would have had a spot on him. So. See, what Catholics do is they call flesh God because of their little wafer cookie. And when you, through the scriptures, which we just went through, showing that the flesh is sinful, that he was um, made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Romans 8 says it plainly. Our Lord said it plainly. Okay? I don't know what else to say. There is nothing more to say. There is nothing more to say. Catholic, you're wicked, you're evil, and you need to repent because that wafer cookie is not God and your wafer cookie cannot save you. Okay? You need to repent. You need to come to the Lord broken of your self-righteousness. And no, it's your fault. It is your fault. Know it. And call upon the name of the Lord in fear of him because he's going to send you to hell unless he save you. There's nothing more to be said on this subject. There is nothing more to be said. There, I answered your stupid skin suit thing. Actually, let me turn it. Explain your skin suit teaching there, Catholic. Oh, don't worry. You already did in the catechism. And hey, those of you who are going to defend this Catholic, what else can I say? You're deceived. You're deceived by a very good liar. So that's going to be it for this video, brethren. Um, th there's nothing more to be said. <laughs> there is nothing more to be said. Nothing more to be said. 
deal with what we went through today. And if you come up with arguments, well, what about that? You're a Catholic. You're a Catholic. End of story. End of story. So that's it. Um, a beloved brother of mine, of ours, um, got a hold of me before started this video. Um, who I'm going to be calling. I'm going to call you, brother. Um, please keep in your prayers, brethren, Church of the Living God. A brother by the name of Jeff. Um, he is in, if, if I could, brother, if I could help you, I would. Please pray for him because he is in some financial peril. The Lord will provide for his needs, but um, things are looking pretty bleak for him right now. And also, too, his health is not doing very well. So please continue to pray for your brother Jeff, okay? And also, please continue to pray uh, pray for our brother from the Northeast, Brother Floyd, um, who's just going through. Let's pray for him. Pray for him. Pray for one another, brethren. Pray for the babes. Pray for people, the babes, who will encounter these Catholics, who will adhere to wicked arguments like this. And try to deceive people into some self-righteousness. And you Catholics. There's nothing more to say. There's nothing more to say. I, I've, you know, there have been, praise the Lord. The Lord had me to do several videos addressing this. This one specifically. And like I said, I've been waiting on this for a couple months for the Lord to give the green light. He gave the green light. Thank you. Thank you, beloved. Thank you, beloved. And I hope this answers your question. I hope it does. I hope it does. And I have confidence in the Lord that you'll see. It's like, oh, yeah. That... And if not... But I have confidence that the Lord will reveal truth. And to those of you who have eyes to see, you will see. And those of you who want to be indignant and justify your own petty little religion of Catholicism, <laughs> go lick the bottom of Sosa's foot. So, that's going to be it for this video, brethren. We love you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who help us and pray for us and support us. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And remember, we can never repay you. We could never repay you. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, gives us just what we need to pay our bills. That's it. We could never repay you. We can never, we can never repay you. Your Lord willing, the fruit, spiritual fruit, is your reward. We can never repay any of you, because we are truly poor saints. We are truly poor. We are dependent on the provision of our Lord Jesus Christ through you, the Church of the Living God. We could never, we could never repay you. Never. Never. And bless you. We are your servants. So, enough of my rambling. Got to get this uploaded. We love you. We will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.